right, uh, blessed day everyone. It is a beautiful day in the park. I just, I love being outdoors and, and just being in God's creation, um, feeling the wind. I love feeling the wind. It reminds me of just His Holy Spirit. <laughs> um, but before we begin, let us pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you and we praise you, God. We thank you that you are love, Lord, and your love covers a multitude of sins. We thank you that although we don't deserve it, you love us anyway. And, and Father, I just pray that you open all of our hearts to receive your word, Lord, to receive your truth. I pray that your word goes forth. We know that your word is sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of our hearts so i just pray that it be your words lord help me to decrease so you can increase that you get all the glory honor and praise in the name of jesus christ we pray amen amen all right so today's word in matthew 5 verses 1 to 12 and seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, and this is Jesus. Jesus is before the people, and he, he's up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely, for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. Amen. Amen. The past couple months, when I've been sharing a word one Sunday of the month, I've been going through the Beatitudes, and, and so we are on the Beatitudes series, and we will go over today the last one of the series part eight and we'll go over blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake amen so the greek word for persecuted according to strong's concordance is dioko the definition is to put to flight pursue by implication to persecute. According to the helps word studies, it's, it's an aggressively chase, like a hunter pursuing a catch or a prize. It can be used positively, earnestly pursue, or negatively, zealously persecute, hunt down. Amen. And when we follow God, when we turn our lives to the Lord, you know, the works of darkness, the enemy does not like that, and we become targets. Amen? So now in John 15, verses 18 to 25, it says, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me. And this is Jesus speaking. It hated Jesus before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, 
but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would have no sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would have no sin. But now they have seen and also hated both me and my father. But this happened that the word might be fulfilled, which is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. Amen. So those who hate God's children, in reality, they hate God. Amen. Because all we're doing is just walking with the Lord. All we're doing is just walking in the image of Christ. And when people persecute us, they're not really doing it unto us. They're doing it unto God. In James 3, verses 8 to 10, But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil. With it, we bless our God and Father, and with it, we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Amen. When we speak against one another, we are speaking against people who have been made in God's image. God loves them. Amen. In the testimony, we heard that God is love. Amen. <laughs> I'm just feeling this. So now uh, let's move forward and we're just going to talk about the hall of persecution in the Bible. Amen. You know, we know there's the hall of faith, but there are so many people, characters in the Bible that really went through it, that were persecuted, that were ridiculed. So I am going to name a few today. The first one that came to mind is Joseph. In Genesis 37, verses 1 through 4, it says, Now Jacob dwelt in the land where his father was a stranger, in the land of Canaan. This is the history of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brothers. And the lad was with the sons of Bila and the sons of Zopa. His father's wives and Joseph brought a bad report of them to his father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age. Also, he made him a tunic of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Amen. You know, I, I can't imagine Joseph's siblings, they're wondering why, why is our father favoring this, this sibling over me, right? And you know, you can't imagine how they're feeling towards Jacob, Joseph, and Jacob, their father. But in Genesis 37, 16 to 18. And so Jacob was telling Joseph, can you look for your brothers? And so Joseph said, he came across a man who he thought might have known where they went. So he said, I'm seeking my brothers 
please tell me where they are feeding their flocks. And the man said, they have departed from here, for I heard them say, let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them in Dothan. Now when they saw him afar off, even before he came near them, they conspired against him to kill him. And they said to one another, look, this dreamer is coming. They're making fun of Joseph. Come, therefore, let us now kill him and cast him into some pit. And we shall say, some wild beast has devoured him. We shall see what will become of his dreams. But Reuben, one of his brothers, a nice brother, heard it, and he delivered him out of their hands and said, Let us not kill him. And Reuben said to them, Shed no blood, but cast him into this pit which is in the wilderness, and do not lay a hand on him, that he might deliver him out of their hands and bring him back to his father. So it came to pass, when Joseph had came, come to his brothers, that they stripped Joseph of his tunic, the tunic of many colors that was on him. Can you just imagine how Joseph must have felt? Like his own brothers were doing this to him. And then they took him and cast him into a pit. And the pit was empty. There was no water in it. And they sat down to eat a meal. So after they took the clothes off of Joseph, they put him into a pit, left him there with no water, right? And then they just decided to sit down and have a meal. <laughs> like, wow, wow. <laughs> then they lifted their eyes and looked, and there was a company of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels, bearing spices, balm, and myrrh on their way to carry them down to Egypt. So Judah, another brother of Joseph, said to his brothers, What profit is there if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh. And his brothers listened. Then Midianite traders passed by. So the brothers pulled Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. And he took Joseph to Egypt. So their father, Jacob, did not know that what his brothers had really done to Joseph. They all said, oh, he died in the wilderness. Some beast has devoured him, has, has killed him. But Jacob had went through so much grief and pain over his son and his siblings saw that. And then Joseph went on a journey, quite a journey in fact. And um, you know, after he was sold in Egypt, uh, he became a slave in Potiphar's house. And but the key thing is, you know, in this story, if you read the story of Joseph, that God was with him all that time. So even though he was sold as a slave, he still had favor with, with Potiphar. You know, he had favor and he became the right hand of Potiphar. But his story doesn't end there. <laughs> you know, pa uh, Joseph, you know, was falsely accused by Potiphar's wife. You know, Potiphar's wife wanted to lay with him, and but Joseph did not want to do anything. You know, he said, oh, you are his wife. I cannot do this against the king, right? And so his Potiphar's wife just accused him and, and created a lie that he tried to assault her. And, and so because of that, Joseph was put into prison. And it's like, wow, like one thing after the other. And he spent quite a long time in prison. But it was in prison where 
God really humbled him and spoke to him. And when he was ready, you know, God used him mightily to deliver the people out, of, out through a famine. And so now we will pick it up towards the end of the story in Genesis 50, verse 20, when he finally reconciles with his brother. And his brothers did not recognize him at all because he was finally of, of rank. You know, he, he looked like an Egyptian, right? Um, but he was like at the right hand of Pharaoh. And so his siblings were afraid when they were in front of Joseph. But this is what Joseph says to his brothers. He says, but as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive, amen? You know what the enemy tries to do for evil against us, God can use it for good, amen? So another character in the Bible, in the New Testament, is Saul. He's quite an interesting fellow, too. <laughs> to say. In Acts 9, verses 1 to 5, it says, Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus so that if he found any who were of the way, so notice how it's du ca capital W here for the way. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So if he found any of who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. You know, Saul, he was just traveling, traveling to Damascus, and all of a sudden, a bright light shone from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you were persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goats. And so in the beginning of the story, Saul was actually persecuting the disciples of the Lord, right? And then the Lord came before him and said, you're persecuting me. So in Acts 22, verses 9 to 11, and this is Saul speaking, and he said, And those who were with me indeed saw the light and were afraid that they did not hear the voice of him who spoke to me. So I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, Arise and go into Damascus, and there you will be told all things which are appointed for you to do. And since I could not see for the glory of that light, being led by the hand of those who were with me, I came into Damascus. So Saul became spiritually blind when he came into the glory of the light. And that's the light of Jesus, isn't it? In 1 John 2, verses 9 to 11, he who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness, and does not know where he is going, because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Amen. We can become blinded, spiritually blinded, when we have hate in our hearts towards another, amen? But when we walk in love, we walk in light, we walk in his light. So now, back in the story of Saul, in Acts 9, verses 10 to 16. Now 
Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him, the Lord said in a vision, Ananias, and he said, here I am, Lord. So the Lord said to him, arise and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Junus for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying. And in a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. You know, Ananias must have been thinking, like, are you serious? Like, you want me to come to this guy that was persecuting your people <laughs> and try to kill us all? It's like, really? <laughs> And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. Amen. So even though Saul was persecuting those who followed Jesus, God had changed his heart, amen? God can change anyone's heart. So now, in Acts 26, verses 17 to 18, and this is the Lord speaking to Saul. He says, I now send you to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. And they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Amen. You know, it's quite amazing because Saul was the one who was who became blind, who was walking in darkness, and, and then God brought him into the light. And now God is using him to lead other people. From darkness to light of man. God can use anybody. So although Saul has changed, it does not mean that he will not suffer for his name's sake. Amen. You know, when we follow God, it doesn't mean that we won't suffer or go through hardships. And I will elaborate on that a, a little bit later later. So now the greatest example of all who face severe persecution is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. In John 5, verses 5 to 9, Now a certain man was there who had infirmity 38 years, and that's a really long time to have sickness, to have pain, whatever that infirmity was. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been in that condition a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Rise take up your bed and walk and immediately the man was made well took up his bed and walked and that day was a sabbath amen that day was a sabbath uh oh <laughs> in john 5 verse 16 for this reason they persecuted jesus and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. All Jesus did was healed a man and he was persecuted for it. In Matthew 5 verse 11, Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you 
and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. In 1 Peter 2, verses 21 to 23, For to this you were called, each and every one of us, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. So when we ourselves are being reviled and persecuted, we can commit ourselves to God who judges righteously. Amen? In Romans 12, verses 17 to 19 says, Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, if <laughs> it is possible, as much as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to the give place to wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Amen. So we don't have to take matters into our own hands, and we don't have to try to defend ourselves and say, like, hold on, wait, wait, no, we don't have to do any of that. <laughs> we can just give it all to the Lord. Amen. So now Let's focus on the latter part of this verse. Matthew 5, verse 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Amen? The Greek word for kingdom, according to Strong's Concordance, is basilia. Definition is kingdom, sovereignty, royal power, the usage is kingship, sovereignty, authority, rule especially of God, both in the world and in the hearts of men. Amen? There's another verse that says, For the kingdom of God does not come with observation, for the kingdom of God is within us. Amen? So now in Acts 14, verse 22, Straightening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith and saying, We must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. Amen. We must. It's a must. Unfortunately, it's a must. <laughs> we must go through tribulations and persecution to enter the kingdom of God. Amen? Okay, Lord. <laughs> Help us all. But I just wanted to give you guys this encouraging, these encouraging verses here in 2 Corinthians 4, verses 7 to 10. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God, and not of us. Amen? For apart from God, we can do nothing. It's the power of God. We are hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. Can I hear an amen? <laughs> we are perplexed, but not in despair. Amen? Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Amen? <laughs> Always caring about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. Amen. Thank you, Lord. I know we've been through it. We've all been through it. <laughs> but praise God that it's His strength, that it's Him holding us up together. Amen. Praise the Lord. In Psalm 11, verses 1 to 5, In the Lord I put my trust. 
how can you say to my soul, flee as a bird to a mountain? For look, the wicked bend their bow. They make ready their arrow on the string that they may shoot secretly at the upright in heart. Talk about persecution, am I right? <laughs> if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, his eyelids test the son of men. The Lord tests the righteous, but the wicked and the one who loves violence, his soul hates a man. We cannot expect that things will be easy <laughs> when we follow the Lord. The Lord will still test us. It reminds me of the quote from the TV series, The Chosen. And the quote is, when has it ever been easy for our people, amen? <laughs> when has it ever been easy for our people? In Matthew 5, verses 43 to 48, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, Love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Amen. And we can't do this on our own strength. I can attest to that. You know, it's just so hard. <laughs> well, all we have to do is just pray, like, Lord, help me. Help me do this, God. Help me just to just love. Amen. That you may be sons or daughters of your Father in heaven. For he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? You know, yesterday was April 15th and taxes were due, okay? So, you know, just kidding. But, um, <laughs> you know, those tax collectors, you know, back in the days, they were um, a big opponent or, you know, the people who believed in God greatly opposed them. Um, but if they loved, you know, the tax collectors loved those who loved them. You know, we're considered, do not even the tax collectors do the same, that we're doing the same thing as them. <laughs> and if you greet your brethren only, if you only greet the people that you know, the people that you love, and, and don't greet those who don't, you don't like, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore, you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. It is not the world's definition of perfect. It is about reaching spiritual maturity, amen? It is no longer being immature, but loving one another. Despite differences, despite people that rub us the wrong way. It takes spiritual maturity to love, amen? And it's loving, not, not with lip service, but sincerely from the heart, amen? And in Luke 23, verses 34, and this is the greatest love of all. This is Jesus when he was on the cross, after he was persecuted, after he was beaten and mocked and spat upon and ridiculed. They were all making fun of him when he just was dying and he laid his own life on the cross. 
Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Amen. And that's love. Help us and give us your heart to love, Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Our Father in heaven, we thank you and we praise you, God. We thank you that you paved the way for us, Lord. Just as how you were persecuted and mocked and spoken, spoken really bad to you, Lord. You still loved on them, Lord. Since we follow in your footsteps, we too will go through persecution. We too will go through the things that you did. Lord, but I just pray, I pray that you give us your heart, God. Give us your heart to just love on the people. Love on the people that are against us, Lord. For you love them too. And you can change hearts like you did Saul. You changed Saul from persecuting those who followed you and, and murdering them to just, you changed his life around and you turned his heart and used him for your glory. So Lord, just give us your heart, Lord. And just like in the movie Tortured for Christ, how they were in prison and being beaten and they were praying for the prison guards and Lord, we may not be going through that right now, but whatever persecution, how big or small we're going through, just help us love like you do. We can't do this on our own strength. Sometimes it feels impossible. It's hard to forgive. But Lord, we know that nothing is impossible with you, Lord. Give us your heart. Give us your love. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace today. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless everyone. <laughs>